Hey gang! I was convinced to do this video by X Factor, one of the gaming YouTubers that I've been subscribed to for several years. He and I were discussing hardware one day, and after he looked over the list of stuff that I have in my rig, he strongly encouraged me to put this video up. So here goes. A few things to keep in mind. One, right now I have a nasty cold and I'm congested as all hell, so I sound pretty bad. Two, I have pretty bad lighting in my office. I'll keep both of the windows open, and I have a big fat LED on the top of my DSLR, so hopefully that won't cause any nasty glare, but will provide enough light. Third is about the system itself, and that's cable management. It isn't really a concern for me. If cables will get in my way, or have the potential for getting in my way, then I'll zip tie them down and move them. But otherwise, that makes no functional difference to the computer whatsoever. Don't let other people tell you otherwise. It's not going to affect cooling or anything else. I don't care how the machine looks because the machine has a job to do, and that's to help me play games and edit videos. I don't care how it looks. But go ahead and put comments down below if you think otherwise. Now, the list of hardware that I have in my gaming rig is in one of the links down below. If you want to follow along, go ahead and call that up. That page has a bunch of URLs pointing off to each of the pieces of hardware that I have installed. Now I'm going to go through the hardware in functions. So I'll be bouncing around back and forth between sections of the machine. Sometimes the motherboard, sometimes the outside, sometimes the monitors, etc, etc. And you're probably asking about that nasty torture chamber looking device that's sitting in front of the LCDs. I'll get to that. Just bear with me. We'll start the show with the case, which is a Corsair Obsidian Series 900D. This is a behemoth of a case and is perfect for the kind of build that I put together. I chose this near 60 pound monster because of all the space inside. The intent was to allow me to put all of my water cooling hardware inside the case. And I'll get to that water cooling stuff momentarily. But as you can see inside the case is a little full but it's mostly due to the water cooling lines, pumps, radiators, fans, and whatnot. The motherboard almost looks microscopic in comparison. The motherboard is an Asus Rampage 5 Extreme. The CPU an Intel 5960X, which I've overclocked to 4.3 GHz. And the RAM is 64 GB of G-Skill Rip Jaws. Down below it, powering all, is a Corsair AX1500i power supply, but it's a little difficult to see. For storage, my system drive is a 500GB Samsung SM951 M.2 SSD. I have it connected to a PCIe card versus directly into the motherboard. The PCIe slot that I have the card in shares the lanes with the built-in M.2 slot, so it all works out. I have two 2TB two Samsung Evo 850 SSDs, which I have striped into a 4TB volume. And finally, I have two 4TB off-label hard disks, which are striped together into an 8TB volume. The SSD volume is being used to store completed videos, projects, and my other data. And the hard drive volume will be used to record gameplay to. And yes, I know the danger of using a striped volume. Don't worry, I'll be backing up the important stuff. Now you're looking at the disks and cabling and you're seeing an extra 1TB Evo 840 SSD. It's just sitting there on top of the rest of the disks, kind of messy like. You're thinking, Jason, what the fuck is that drive for? It's temporary scratch space for video editing such as this video. One of my planned upgrades will be a new Samsung 960 Pro 1TB NVMe drive for my system drive. Once they're actually shipping, I'll pick one of those up and reformat the 500GB Samsung M.2 for video scratch. But until then, I'll be keeping the SSD in place. Video is handled by a pair of Pascal Titan X video cards SLI'd together using an EVGA high bandwidth bridge. I'm using the EVGA bridge versus the NVIDIA OEM one because the NVIDIA bridge has too many angles on it that don't work with the water blocks that are installed. The cards are gently overclocked, plus 200 MHz clock and plus 500 MHz memory clock. I have two displays for my system. The primary one is an Asus ROG Swift PG278Q. This is their first 27 inch 1440p 144Hz screen that does G-Sync. I've had it since it was released a couple of years ago and I love it. Next to it is a no-name South Korean 
27 inch 1440p IPS panel that I bought a bunch of years ago. Back when the Apple 27 inch 1440p displays were going for over a thousand bucks, this one cost me a mere 400. It's a secondary display and it doesn't need to have perfect color or fast refresh rate. Sound is rather important to me and I try not to skimp here. It starts inside the PC with a Sound Blaster ZXR card. I always prefer a discrete sound card over a built-in motherboard DAC or externally attached one. I find that the Sound Blaster produces the right volume, clarity, and kind of sound for the gaming that I do. For sound output, I connect my Sennheiser HD800 headphones directly to the sound card via this extender. The Sound Blaster's headphone output is amplified and that amplification is carried through the extender here. So the Sennheiser phones, which have a 300 ohm impedance value, still sound perfect. The Zens have a natural tendency towards mid to high range sound. They're more suitable for listening to music than gaming. In games that have a lot of explosions, such as the first person shooters that I play, the results can be somewhat ear crushing in mids and highs. I tame this to an extent using Sound Blaster's mixer software. While I'm playing, I tune up the bass frequencies just a small amount and I lessen the mid and treble ranges a bit. This makes action gaming far more enjoyable and lifelike. For sound input, I have a few devices. First, the mixer, an RME Babyface Pro. This is a mixer that another gamer, Levelcap, has shown on his channel a few times. I like it because its output can be entirely digital. Prior to the Babyface, I was using a Mackie 4 channel analog mixer connected to my Sound Blaster's RCA inputs. But that required me to rely on the Sound Blaster's analog to digital converter, which never really sounded as good as I would have liked. The Sound Blaster's DAC is beyond reproach, but the ADC could use some work. So I needed to find a way to send pre-digitized sound to that originating from an analog microphone. Answer, the baby face. I have two microphones connected to it, which I'll explain in a moment. The baby face connects via USB over to my iPad, not the PC. I do that so that I can control the mixer with RME's iPad application, and I can do that live while I'm playing games. If someone in a game's VoIP says that my microphone is too hot or too quiet, I can adjust it without alt tabbing out to RME's Windows application. Instead, I just make the adjustments on my iPad. But how's the sound getting to the PC? This fiber link that you see on the left hand side of the box. It terminates directly into the Sound Blaster. The sound arrives to the Sound Blaster already digitized, thereby completely bypassing its ADC. You probably noticed that goofy looking microphone attached to my Zens. That's the microphone that I use for in-game VoIP. It's a Rode Lavalier mic with an XLR adapter allowing me to connect it directly to the RME. But what you see here are the remnants of a mod mic. I purchased one of those because I really like their magnetic attachment point and the flexible mic wand. I cut the mic cable off of it, stuck it to the Zens, and then clamped the Rode mic to the end of it. It's something of a waste of a perfectly working mod mic, but the setup works perfectly for me. And here's what I'm talking to right now to do the voiceover. A Rode Broadcaster mic, which is attached to their mic arm, which is attached to this behemoth that I promised to explain later. Like the lav mic, the Broadcaster is a condenser microphone, which is useful in noisy environments. The challenge with the condenser is that you have to stay close to it for it to really pick up your voice clearly. I found that while I was gaming, I was leaning away from the mic stand because it was starting to distract me. In five or ten minutes into gaming, I'd find myself leaning towards the right, away from the microphone, and people in VoIP would say, Hey Jason, I can't hear you. So it's for that reason why I use this excellent mic only for voiceover, and I stick to the lab for gaming. And finally for sound, a truly ghetto solution if there ever was one. I took two pieces of plywood and glued some echo-reducing foam to them as shown. This helps to kind of dampen some of the, the hum from the fans and the pumps and whatnot from the machine. Let's head back into the PC for one of the aspects that I'm quite pleased with, and that's the cooling. The CPU and both GPUs are water-cooled. The CPU is on its own loop with its own reservoir, pump, and radiator. The GPUs are on a second loop, again, with a separate res, pump, and two radiators. Central to the cooling are the blocks from EK. The CPU block is their Supremacy Evo Elite, and the blocks on the Titans are their standard full-size units. The CPU loop uses a Swiftec Maelstrom version 2 res and pump combo, 
it actually sits up here in the five and a quarter bays. The line egresses the pump then hits the CPU block first. From there, it goes up to the Alpha Cool 480 millimeter by 60 millimeter copper radiator. This radiator has seven Noctua 120 millimeter fans in a push-pull configuration. There just isn't quite enough room for that eighth fan. And then from the rad, the water exits and returns to the reservoir. You may be asking about it or even poking fun at the flex that I have in the lines here. I kind of need that slack so that I can pull the reservoir out and add more water. The GPU loop uses an EK140 Revo D5 pump and cylindrical res. The water egresses the pump, hits the top GPU, then the bottom GPU, then down to the Alpha Cool 480 by 60 millimeter radiator. From there, it actually goes to a second radiator, an Alpha Cool 240 by 45 millimeter unit. From there, it, head back, it heads back up to the res. Each of the radiators has a set of Nocto 120 millimeter fans pulling air through them. All through this, you'll notice that the lines are clear and that I'm running clear fluid. It's actually just plain distilled water with nothing more than a silver kill coil in each reservoir. I don't believe in using colored cooling liquids because they quite simply detract from the cooling capacity of the water that they're made from. And please don't let any of the sales folks try to suck you into anything different. Water cools better. Just use water. Controlling this cooling infrastructure is an Aqua Aero 6 XT controller. It has four PWM inputs and can connect to the motherboard via a USB 2 header so that their Aqua Suite software can talk to it. I have each of the pumps on their own channels. The top seven fans are condensed into a single channel via a SwiftTech splitter. The bottom six fans are also condensed into the fourth channel, again using a splitter. I run everything at a constant RPM. Nothing changes speed based on the load or the temperature. The 13 fans are all running at 700 RPMs. The SwiftTech pump is running at its lowest speed, which is 1200 RPMs, and the EK pump for the GPUs is running at its lowest speed, which is 800 RPMs. At no point do any of these pumps or fans spin faster. They stay at a nice, constant, quiet speed, even when I'm editing video or cranking through some Battlefield 1. Complementing all this liquid cooling are three case fans. I have two 120mm Noctuas on the front here, and on the back a 140mm Noctua. These are all connected to, this, to the motherboard header via another splitter, and running at a constant 400 RPMs. Let's talk about this metal monstrosity. It's called the Oboto Revolution, and it's a godsend to anyone that tries to solve the perennial problem of how do I use a keyboard and mouse and joystick throttle and rudder pedals? Or a keyboard and mouse and a steering wheel and pedals? The answer is the Rev. It has attachment points for the keyboard and mouse tray, as you can see up kind of to the right of the chair. Front and center of the chair is the mount for my Thrustmaster Warthog flight stick, which is sitting at the floor at the moment. And on the left side is a mount for the Warthog's throttle stick, which I also have sitting on the floor so that I can get into and out of the chair easily. Underneath the displays, the MFG crosswind pedals. It all works so perfectly. When I'm FPS gaming, I can keep the keyboard and tray in front of me. Even, it even fits right in front of the flight stick. That way I can leave it in place if I'm playing a game such as Star Citizen that involves both FPS and flight. When it's time to climb into a ship, I can swivel the tray out of the way so that the flight stick doesn't collide with it. It's very elegant, if not a bit scary looking. It's also quite heavy. The whole thing weighs over 200 pounds. And it requires a buddy to help you assemble it, because you're not going to do it alone. The one problem I found with the Rev is the OEM seat that ships with it. It's obnoxiously bad. And I do mean horrible. And here it is. Metal bars with the thinnest of padding between your ass and said bars. After sitting on it for less than 30 minutes, I was in awful pain. So I pulled it off and replaced it with a slightly used Herman Miller Aeron chair. I had to remove the armrests that come attached to the chair, but that's okay. I didn't need those while I'm playing. And the Aeron isn't attached to the Rev at all. It's just captive to it by the Rev's feet. This is handy since if I'm flying and using my rudder pedals, I won't kick myself away from the desk due to the casters on the Aeron. All in all, it's a bit of a hack, but it works perfectly. I can see possibly replacing the Aeron with a nicer chair, but I'm in no hurry. I actually have one of these at work, and I can sit in it comfortably for hours on end. As the Mythbusters say, 
If it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. There's my PC in the office it sits in, and everything is over-engineered. I enjoy using it, I enjoy tinkering with it, and that's all that matters. But what do you think? Leave some comments down below and I'll read them and likely respond to them. Thanks for stopping by and I'll likely see you on the battlefield real soon.